thank you all again for being with us. Concluding session of this uh, conference on uh, education for human security. We have the pleasure of having with us Professor Febi Konduri. Sorry, uh, Febi is uh, an environmental economist, and uh, she is also the chair of a special hub on, on climate change and climate change subjects as part of the Athens University. Also with us, we should have Remus, Remus Bricopi, president of the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration of Romania. This but not last, for sure, Gary Jacobs, who is the executive chair and the, also the president of the World Academy of Arts and Science and is also the executive chair of the uh, uh, campaign that the uh, World Academy is uh, manning, is uh, uh, unraveling, I would say, uh, is, is conducting as we speak with the United Nations on the subject of human security. So this was no coincidence uh, that the topic was selected of education for human security. Uh, we heard uh, so many interesting remarks, even just to I think would be uh, worth uh, uh, repeating, but we don't have that time. We don't have the luxury of reiterating what has been said right now. But I want to uh, just restate one point, you know, for those who may have not uh, followed uh, the discussion. I think that when we talk about human security, we should be aware of the angle of the of the perspective that we are talking from um, is one specific angle is the human angle the individual angle uh, is humanity is uh, uh, is the essence of human uh, souls uh, is the essence of who we are uh, and this is uh, fundamentally true uh, and this is the reason why we have been actually engaged by the United Nations to accompany a specific office of the United Nations that is called the uh, security unit in the uh, development and the and the uh, carrying out the campaign on human security. Uh, this is so uh, close to the uh, core issues that the World Academy has ever uh, ever conducted. And, and so this is part of uh, the organizational history and its future. I think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, although we very often we talk about governance, and this is another subject that we, we, have, uh, we have faced, that we have discussed in, through, for instance, the Global Leadership Program, uh, that was uh, another program, another successful program of the World Academy uh, just concluded a year ago, again with the United Nations. We spoke a lot about governance uh, and uh, obviously in that case, the protagonist or the uh, responsible entity are states. Here, when we talk about human security, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the rights and the obligations of, of the individuals come first. They come first, but they are not uh, exclusive. They have to be seen actually not uh, uh, as uh, anta in an antagonistic position uh, towards uh, member states, towards UN member states or governments. They have to be uh, seen as complementary. So I think that this complementarity somehow is very important because if we lose that particular perspective, it will be very hard really to um, to reach uh, a uh, not not just a, a consensus because the consensus about human security already is already there, but to uh, implement human security to make sure that the concept of human security is really enacted uh, at uh, individual levels and also at state level, at governmental level. The um, other point that I wanted to make is uh, that in doing so, <laughs> obviously we're talking about education as the conduit, as the necessary conduit for a transformation. Uh, a, a transformation in terms of the educational system, but it also as a form of cultural revolution. 
because it's only through a cultural revolution that we can uh, really meaningfully uh, um, reach the, uh, the our own target. I mean, in order to implement the sense of what is human security. Another point that has been uh, flagged at some point, at probably the very beginning of the conference, the very first day, Gary certainly reminds it reminds me that uh, is the concept of education and culture as a lifeline, as a therapeutical element, as therapy. I think that this is also uh, very important to be kept in mind because uh, uh, if we want to achieve a genuine culture, if we want to breed a culture internationally, it has to touch bodies and minds and souls. I mean, the uh, uh, the culture of the soul has to be uh, taken into account because we want to transform uh, habits and we want to take into account, we want to absorb and, and uh, represent feelings. Now, since we're talking about feelings, uh, I think uh, I want to, uh, to hear first from uh, uh, Ramos, who just uh, came on board. Ramos is uh, um, the president of the National University of Political Studies and Public Administration of Romania. Ramos, uh, thank you for joining us in this concluding session of the conference. So what are your feelings uh, about the uh, level of education that we have nowadays? Is this level of education globally uh, acceptable up to this transformational role that we should uh, um, embody in one way or another in order to represent and to assert the principle and the concept of human security? Ramos, to I, you first. And the hi, Donato. Also is valid for the other, other two uh, speakers, of course. Hi. I uh, do believe globally, so I'm not talking about uh, Romania, I'm not talking about a specific country. Globally, we are, we arrived in a moment when we don't know how to do education with our kids. As a former minister of education, as a university professor, um, having 28 years of international experience, uh, I see this uh, everywhere. <clears throat> On one hand, we have pedagogy and settings uh, established 19th century. And we reject all the novelties in you know what's going on around us. Pan the pandemic situation had, besides the negative and the disaster across the globe with a lot of millions of people dying and uh, you know the sacrifice, had just a small positive aspect to impose the digital instruments, including in the learning. But after the pandemic situation concluded, all schools, almost all schools and almost all universities came back to the very official settings of the classroom. We don't, in order to educate someone, you need to understand his psychology, his or her needs uh, to understand the society in which our students today will live in the, in the next uh, uh, five uh, uh, decades, pro professionally speaking, but we still approach education and including educational policies in old fashion. This is one aspect. I'll give you a concrete example, and after that, I'll move to the second uh, step. In Romania, like everywhere, there are a kind of compulsory literature readings. According to some studies, just 3% of Romanian kids uh, finish these readings compulsory. And as a minister 10 years ago, I said, why we don't try to complement in another way? For example, combining reading with movies, because there are movies which follow exactly a specific um, uh, piece of literature and to discuss the idea is to be in dialogue with our kids, to help them to discover 
uh, the the uh, arts, the literature. The... No, it was a big reaction from teachers. How can the Minister of Education encourage pupils not to read? In fact, I was discussing about how we can enrich our kids besides the 3% of the kids reading. This is one aspect. The second aspect, so if we speak about the classroom, so we have problems in the classroom, but we have also problems in the system. And today we were, and the day before, and two days before, we were discussing about big percentage of um, uh, out of school kids. This is not a success. This is not a success in Romania, as is not a success in the United States or in a, a sub-Saharan country. We set as an objective 2015 to win the fight with uh, exclusion of kids from primary. Let's look to statistics. So we have big problems and I don't agree with you, Donato. You know, I fully uh, uh, agree on many topics. I highly respect you, but you said it's already agreed uh, uh, human security is a topic. No, we have not agreed this. Let's look in the conflict war situations and how many millions of kids are out of school or out of any idea of security. So these are the signals, uh, you know, I enjoyed, I'll switch to something else. I enjoyed the discourse of the Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, a couple of days ago saying, if we keep this way in 300 years, we'll have, you know, gender equity and policies. So we have to stop to say, in a very nicely way, positive things when the context is negative. It's the same with school. It's the same with kids. It's the same with basic concepts. Gary, Donato, and many colleagues from our uh, academy, we were discussing a lot how it's possible to have leaders around the, around the world without a minimum level of knowledge on fundamental topics like human security like Paris Agreement. So this, in fact, the way, the, the reason for which we decided to organize this conference on education, on human security, one of the reasons is the fact that because we realize we are not doing our job correctly in our universities and in our school. Not, not myself, not uh, Donato, not Gary, not... Uh, but we look at the outcomes of the system and we have to revisit the concept of education, of educational systems, and we have to push on some uh, policies. And with this, I conclude, Gary said today uh, in an earlier session, human security is not a specialization. It's something that should be embedded in all school or academic programs. And if we succeed to do this, then citizens, leaders in the near future, maybe will be more responsible. Full stop. Remus, thank you very much. And uh, uh, you did not contradict me at all. Uh, you just explained it better. Uh, you explained better what I wanted to, to say. You elaborated on the concept. I meant saying uh, the concept of human security exists. But as you pointed out, that does not mean that it is understood. It does not mean that this is explained or this is accepted. Uh, so this is definitely a task uh, ahead of us. Uh, now, along the same vein, I would uh, pass the floor to Fabi. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think it's, uh, th th this is the right way of concluding this, this conference, have a sort of uh, introduction from the three uh, speakers. And then I will go more in depth with uh, a set of questions uh, to summarize the proceedings uh, themselves. So uh, Fabi, uh, the question to you is the same as for Remus. I mean, what, uh, what is the relevance of human security for education? How do you see 
uh, education as a driver for uh, cultural change. Uh, if that's the case, and if that is something that you also um, would support. Yes, thank you very much. I um, I definitely think that education is the main driver for for any change, actually, uh, for any change that can be um, stimulated, uh, designed, developed, implemented by humans. Uh, so what, what is crucial for me is to increase the level of understanding of what human security refers to, the different aspects of human security. So we need to be very clear on what we want to achieve in the, in the setting of human security. I like to be um, explicit and refer to economic security, assuring basic livelihood derived from work, public and environmental resources, or reliable social safety nets. Then it's food security, of course, ready physical and economic access to basic food, health security, access to personal health care and productive public health um, regimes, environmental security. It's about resilience, ecosystem resilience and safety from natural disasters and resource scarcity which of course is um, at risk because of the climate change crisis, the destabilization of climate, which results in increased frequency and severity of um, extreme weather um, conditions. Uh, eco ecosystem collapse is worsening environmental security, of course. The ecosystems on which our production and consumption uh, activity is based are collapsing, and this is very dangerous. Then we have personal security, physical safety from violent conflict, human rights abuses, domestic violence, crime, child abuse, self-inflicted violence, and so on. Community security, safety from oppressive community practices, and political security, freedom from state oppression and abuses of human rights. Now, all these elements of security, which are important, and have various degrees of uh, successful implementation or unsuccessful implementation in different um, locations across the world, in different countries across the world, integrate very nicely with the global framework that we have for um, developing our pathways economic, environmental, and social pathways towards a sustainable world, toward the future that we want. So in 2015, like I said in my previous speech, we've agreed, 193 nations agreed, that our future, the future that we want, can be defined in terms of 17 sustainable development goals that deal with social aspects, economic aspects, environmental aspects, the interaction between them, and these uh, are detailed into 169 uh, targets and um, a, a few uh, hundred uh, KPIs, something approximately to 250 KPIs. And all these elements of human security, economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, political security are easily transpose into targets within the SDGs. And why do I want to put the human security aspect into the SDGs? Because I firmly believe that if we are gonna become 
sustainable. If we are going to get to the future we want in 2030 or a bit beyond that, and I have reasons to say that maybe the SDGs are not achievable by 2030. The uh, Earth does not have such a fast pace of regenerating capacity. And also uh, humans uh, are yet to prove that they have the ability to upskill and reskill and upgrade according to the technological advancement pace. But if the future we want is in the SDGs, then it's nice to integrate the different other initiatives, aspirations, visions into these SDGs so that we have one common framework. It's complicated enough already. It is a very systemic, integrated, interdisciplinary, holistic framework that needs to engage all the stakeholders. And because it is so difficult and because it is holistic enough, it is time that we transpose our education system into systems that can accommodate the knowledge that is needed in order to implement the SDGs. Uh, they can teach this knowledge, they can focus research on better uh, methods and analysis for designing in detail the pathways towards the SDGs for uh, innovating technologies that are relevant into implement for implementing this systemic framework. So we really need to revise our education system in something that can really support our vision and aspirations. And at the moment, like the previous speaker said, our education system does not have any of the elements that are crucial for SDG implementation. First of all, we don't have education for all. There are millions of kids out of school so we don't have access, we don't have inclusivity, we did not manage to transfer resources towards achieving SDG4, good quality education for all. And then where education exists and it is accessible for all is not of the kind that will produce um, uh, adults or youth or children that can engage with some uh, sort of uh, uh, of confidence into uh, the um, the framework, the systemic interdisciplinary framework of the SDGs. So. At the end of the day, we have education systems that work in the silos of disciplines that reproduce inflexible, non-systemic, not integrated um, education structures and, and knowledge. And at the end of the day, we end up with not producing the skills, the knowledge, the um, uh, the understanding that it needed for SDG transposition. I am uh, chairing the Global Climate Hub of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and at the same time, I am uh, the president of the European Association of Environmental Resource Economics. Now, these are two, just to give you an example of, of the difficulties we are facing, even at the research level, even at the university level. These are two global uh, networks, basically. The first one is the global network of 1,800 um, institutions, uh, universities and research center working on sustainability solutions. 
and they have as their Bible the SDGs, and we try to produce technological policy, um, financial, economic, social solutions in a very integrated manner in order to address the transition to the SDGs, while uh, knowing with the deep knowledge that no SDG can be achieved without the others SD, without the other SDGs being achieved. So we have to work in a very systemic framework. And in this uh, uh, global climate hub that I, I chair, um, we realize uh, that uh, what is needed is really an integration and allow me to put just one slide on of the following different elements. We first need to call, find and collect the data. So this is a slide. So we need a climate data platforms and digital applications unit. We need atmospheric physics and climatology. We need climate and energy modeling. We need climate and land use modeling. We need to model climate and health. We need to design innovation structures and accelerate them for producing solutions for climate neutrality and resilience that are of high TRL so that they can be massively accelerated to the market to be massively deployed so that uh, the, the transition gets the pace that we need. We, we have a unit uh, looking at the uh, economic and financing elements of the climate neutrality transition. So we look into the finance, the labor market, the policies, the equity uh, results of the policies that we design and the investments that we suggest and the impl implementation instruments that we uh, develop. And then we have a unit of transformative participatory approaches, national living labs, systems innovation, um, methodologies from bringing all the relevant stakeholders together, the politicians, the policy makers, the NGOs, the technology developers, the scientists, the civil society as a whole, the businesses, the financial institutions in order to co-design the transition pathways. This is the only way to get something implemented if people feel that they co-design something and they own the solution pathway. If they own it, they will support its implementation. And finally, the, everything that has to do with education and upskilling and reskilling with regards to developing and implementing climate change transition pathways. So you can see how many disciplines are integrated here. Almost all natural sciences, social sciences, human sciences, and so on. The European Association of Environmental Resource Economies that has 1,500 institutional members, and it has members from 70 different countries across the world, it is global enough, works only on the just transition policies, finance, labor market, and a bit on the climate and energy and climate and land use. And it's so difficult to really pass the message to this amazing group of top environmental economists across the world that they need to open up from their own silos and work with the other disciplines in order to construct meaningful climate pathways. And this is just an example which comes from a community, environmental economies, that has accepted the need for interdisciplinarity much more than any other um, community in the economics uh, discipline. So this is an example that has effects on the way we teach economics, on the way we do research on economics, on the way we innovate in economics, on the way we design policies, we analyze policies, and the way we fail. 
And that's why we need to change our education, our university, our prominent primary secondary education, because it's not enough to introduce all this into the uh, Placinarity at the university level. You have to prepare the people to really be able to handle interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, frameworks where the silos do not exist anymore. So this is the point I want to make. And it's um, really important that all this effort is not just designed by scientists and educators, but it is co-designed by all stakeholders that need to engage in this transition, in this cultural um, transition and transformation that needs to happen in education. I'll stop here. Libby, thank you very much. And uh, after, after hearing from Ramos and his diagnostics in terms of where the school system is where the educational system is and uh, the uh, failures that we are confronted with we have now heard from phoebe a response a response given by the uh, interagency and multidisciplinary hub that she is leading uh, on the environment and the economics uh, that gives us some answers i mean in terms of uh, uh, being co-creators of responses, for sure. I mean, having a level of participation that uh, can uh, make everybody feel like uh, this is something that we are creating, that we that we own. So a a, a shared ownership. Now, this might be uh, one of the lessons learned uh, from this three-day conference. But I would give the floor to Gary, uh, the president of the World Academy of Art and Science, to uh, give us his insight uh, in terms of what the conference has produced, this uh, wealth of knowledge that uh, have been, has been passed on to us, uh, how do you think we can make good use of it, and what are the key messages that you could offer at this point. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Donato, and my thanks to my fellow panelists, uh, Ramos and Phoebe, for two superb uh, summary statements, uh, which have touched on core issues for this conference and for the work that we're doing in the Academy. Uh, and I, I'm trying to frame my comments in complement to what we've heard from them, uh, and just kind of zoom out a little to look at the big picture in, in a hope that it'll give a, a perspective to how we reconcile uh, the, thing, the issues that we've heard. Uh, there's no question of summarizing this conference. Uh, we've had 26 sessions, 125 speakers, 270 plus participants. Uh, Jonathan Granoff uh, summed it up very well a few sessions ago. He said, it's a tsunami of insights and it's going to take us a long time uh, to process and digest what we've heard fully. But I think there is a context or perspective from which we're gonna to try to do it. And I'd like to start by backing up to 2013, which Donato remembers very well, when we had our first conference at the UN in Geneva on global challenges in the 21st century, where we were really trying, and it's interesting and I'm happy that we didn't spend our whole time in this conference focused on the problems. We know the problems uh, and we're, we have many people here who have been studying them in depth. The question is solutions uh, for those problems. But I started out in the, uh, uh, in the, my opening comments, just briefly summarizing these global challenges and their uh, their continue to increase and continue to raise the level of in sense of insecurity, in spite of all the progress we've made. And I commented that uh, my own view is education is the greatest invention of humanity. Uh, it's not the wheel or the computer or even the internet, though they're phenomenal uh, advances for us, but. Education is really our instrument for conscious social evolution. 
I think what we've heard here uh, in all of the sessions is the fact that the, our, our world, not just our planet, but our humanity is undergoing very rapid transformation, very rapid change. And our institutions are simply not able to keep pace with that. We've signaled, singled out for discussion in this conference the role of education in it. And this discussion itself is part of a bigger picture. Phoebe focused very rightly on the challenges represented by the 17 Sustainable Development Goals as posing a comprehensive framework, uh, which it certainly is. The humanity has never had such a clear uh, and such so much consensus on what are the issues we need to address. But when we try to, and we see, and it's been a, I think a, a consensus of this uh, conference, as well as what we've just heard from two speakers, is that our educational system is not effectively aligned uh, to the, what the needs we have today. Uh, and that goes not just for economics or for climate sciences or anything. I think we've heard in every session, and we've covered a very broad range of disciplines in this discussion and had representation from uh, many more, uh, that no, none of our disciplines, none of our thinking, none of our education is fully attuned and adjusted to meet the challenges we're facing today. And I don't see that so much as a, as a criticism. It, we, we, we need to take it critically. We, can, we can't afford to be complacent about it. But I think it's intended as a perspective to see where we are. We're simply at a point where the need for change, the need for uh, widening our thought process is not only transcending disciplinary boundaries, which has been a main theme of the, uh, the work of the Academy and World University Consortium over five uh, previous conferences, but also our national boundaries and our national conceptions. And human security is all about the fact that we need to change the way we think about security because the, the greatest security threats today are not limited to our traditional definition of security by which, on which the UN was founded and our Security Council of the UN was framed. These challenges can uh, 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 embrace all dimensions of human existence, yet our institutions are not fully uh, have not fully risen to the occasion yet of evolving to adapt to the magnitude of those challenges, not only across uh, different challenges, not only across different disciplines, but as has been mentioned many times, the challenges we face today are much more global. They're not only interdependent with each other, but we depend on the action of the whole humanity in order to address them. So these are evolutionary challenges. And the changes we need, it's not just a question, I think, of fixing our, uh, our educational system, though there's certainly tremendous progress can be made and many very valuable insights have come up and we heard of some very exciting models of what's being done uh, uh, in education today. I think it's a, a, a larger question of, of realigning all of the institutions of national and global society in order to adjust, to accommodate to and have a change in perspective. The World Academy was founded in 1960 by very eminent intellectuals, many of them very eminent scientists who came to the conclusion that science needed to reorient itself. That the scientists who had developed and our founders were uh, very instrumental in the development of nuclear weapons, simply could not afford to consider themselves uh, in, a, in an ivory tower of doing fundamental research and that the responsibilities for the world lie elsewhere. And in the mid 50s, scientists from all over the world gathered and said, we need to take responsibility for the consequences of our work. We are no longer one of many powers in the world 
science has, uh, has shown after World War II, it has a tr tremendous central role in the fate and future and destiny of humanity. And that was led to the, for to the founding of the World Academy of Art and Science. What we saw then in science, we have since seen in virtually every field that however great the accomplishments have been, and we, have, we cannot underestimate the tremendous accomplishments of science in the 20, 20th century or of other fields or of economy, but what Phoebe has been describing in her wonderful presentation in the, uh, the session a, a few hours ago uh, about the need to change our measures and thinking in economics, we've seen in the last two decades, economics has been undergoing a, a, a radical uh, reorientation, at least with the evolution, the development of sustainability economics, ecological economics, formulating new measures, now probably more than a thousand measures uh, to supplement or replace the, the much the narrow conception of GDP. So this is an evolutionary change that we've seen in science. One of our projects of the uh, uh, one of our research academy research organizations partnering with the Academy Force for Good has published two reports on the role of the financial institutions. Uh, with some out of 400 or 450 trillion dollars in financial resources, uh, studying how much of that is actually going into addressing the sustainable development goals. And for the first time, publishing uh, information on that because it's never been disclosed before uh, at the macro level. Uh, and we find virtually less than 10% of it. So, what does that tell us about our global financial institutions? Our global financial system is not primarily oriented towards addressing the most fundamental challenges uh, facing humanity, in spite of the fact that those institutions depend for their very existence and future on the stability of society, on the security of human beings, on the stability and predictability of the future. And the, the work that's being done with them is and they agree, and they honestly agree that they need to change and reorient themselves. And now two months ago, uh, when we launched the Human Security Project, we met with the technology leaders of the world at the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, Las Vegas of all places, where the, the, the largest, the five, seven largest corporations in the world today, all technology leaders, and thousands of others and 120,000 expert business leaders, technology leaders in the field where human security was released as the theme. First time in 50 years that a, a, a CES exhibition, the largest in the world uh, has been themed and they agreed. The association agreed, the executives agreed, the board agreed, and the leaders of the corporations agreed. We cannot operate in a vacuum. We cannot operate simply as businesses. We have to realize the tremendous power of technology, either for good or for bad. It's a double-edged sword. It's going to either make the future of humanity, or it's going to undermine all the progress we've made. We need to accept that business must reorient itself and accept its social purpose, as finance must accept its, its, its social purpose, its human purpose. So I'm saying this, to say, I don't think what we're saying in this conference and the very in, important insights that have been released, revealed already, are unique. It, it's been true of science. It's been true of finance. It's been true of technology. It's been true of economic theory. In fact, it, it, I would say it's true of the arts as well. And there was a comment in the other session that we haven't had enough artists and one I fully endorse. Uh, we, 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 though it's, but in the name of the academy, we have not uh, uh, had enough emphasis on the arts, but the arts, the cinema, uh, 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 all of the, uh, uh, the arts, have a critically important role to play in our coming through this transition 
uh, and addressing these problems uh, as well. Every discipline has a role to play. In one of our, the fascinating discussions, I think it was yesterday, uh, the last session, which Ralph Wolf handled on models of education in the future, uh, the, the work of Ch California State University at Chico, uh, uh, where they, they're arguing that climate change uh, should be, is not a special subject, it should be in every class. Every class in every subject should be related to climate change. And I would say the, the a summary conclusion of this conference is uh, every class, every discipline, every subject of knowledge has a direct relevance or should have a direct relevance to and contribution to human security. And what we've set out in discussing at this conference is only to identify that, that need to, to, to catalog the importance. Just before this, we had the session Jonathan Granoff led on a, a role of law. And it's very fascinating, especially for those who are not come through a legal education to know that even human rights and even international law uh, is not a required central subject for, for the vast majority of those who go through a legal education, let alone of course, the ecological impl implications, the implications of uh, the SDGs, uh, the implications of human security. So what we could say from this is all our institutions in global society have evolved over long periods of time as dimensions of our whole lives. And now we see, as Phoebe mentioned, they're all interconnected, they're all interdependent, they're all interrelated, and we need to bring them all together. And that's not just a question of bringing everybody into the room. Each discipline has to undergo a, a reflection and consider how far are we really related to the fundamental issues facing humanity today, and how far are we con con contributing uh, to those solutions. And I think that's a strong uh, message that has emerged from the sessions today, leaves much, much more work to be done, raises more questions than it answers. Uh, and perhaps many feel already tackling one part of it, uh, what Phoebe's accepted on her, uh, the burden that she's accepted with the network she's, why would anyone want to add anything more uh, to that, uh, it embraces so much. I think it's not a question of burdening any particular group more. It's a question of everybody taking responsibility. Every discipline has a responsibility for this. Every, every field and institution in society has a responsibility. We've been focusing today on the responsibility of, uh, in the last three days, on the responsibility and opportunities and necessity for educational institutions. When we were with the edu with the business technology leaders in the Las Vegas, we were talking about the responsibilities of business. And the, re the third report of the force for good on the technology as a force for good came up with a very important recommendation. I know Phoebe is very familiar with it already, that actually about 40, maybe even 60% of the 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 investment needs or the let's say the financial deficit in funding the SDGs could be met through technological innovation and technological application and dissemination if we really recognize how important this is and channel all our resources for it and i think that's the same message that we have today that education is an instrument for conscious social transformation. It has been so vital to our progress up until now, but compared with the magnitude and speed and complexity of our world, we simply can't be complacent. And nobody, we can't be pointing the fingers at anybody. We all have to change. We met uh, after CES, we met with the uh, interfaith groups, the religious groups in New York, Oh, in their ninth international conference where they have 
very much come together and recognize the differences between religions are much less important than the similarities and the shared values and the power that they have over hundreds of millions of people in the world. And they accepted the theme of human security and what uh, what much more can be done by the, the, the faith-based groups, the interfaith groups in supporting this cause. Uh, Donato's leading our work with the Interparliamentary Union uh, on what parliamentarians all over the world need to understand. And we've been commissioned by the uh, Interparliamentary Union to work with them on messaging to how to not just educate, inform the parliamentarians who are framing laws all over the world at the national level to understand the importance of their contribution to sustainability and to, uh, to peace, stability, and of course, to human security. And we think this is what the human security campaign for all is all about. We're not focusing on one point, we're trying to mobilize all the resources of global society because we don't think we think nothing short of that is necessary. This is so this is conscious social evolution. It's not done by governments. It's not done by multilateral institutions, though they have a critical role to play. It can't be done just by uh, economists. Uh, it it we need the business leaders. We need the uh, these the the. Uh, civil society organizations, we more than anything, we need the youth who are going to inherit the earth to, to contribute in all possible ways. And we see that awakening of youth today, which unprecedented, uh, at least in my view, since the 60s, but perhaps much more than we ever saw and, and more organized and more connected than then. We need to mobilize all of our resources together for this. I think this is this uh, uh, this conference has helped us identify many areas and threads we need to work on. It's only the first step for us uh, in as part of this campaign in the field of education. Thank you, Gary. I think that this concludes the conference.